Hello. Welcome, everybody. Thanks for joining us this evening. We are very excited to be here again. I'm uh, so excited to see some familiar names, some new names out there in the attendees list. Um, we've missed you. If you don't know who I am, my name's Miranda. I am the program director at Artly World Nonprofit. And most of you know us through our artist re relief project that we started back um, during the pandemic to provide free resources to artists, help you transition online, learn about social media, um, learn about grant writing and all sorts of other things. And as many of you know, we paused our programs the beginning of this year and we're really excited. Um, we were taking some time to reevaluate the resources for artists and really redefine what it is that you needed access to. And after talking to countless performers, artists, musicians around the United States and here in Austin, we're based out of Austin, after lots and lots of conversations, um, the thing that kept coming up is the artist community's concerns with artificial intelligence and the impact that it's going to have on your work and livelihood. There's a lot of um, both excitement in the air as well as fear in the air. And we have restarted ARP with this latest iteration of programming to um, support you um, and then help you enhance your knowledge about AI and the different ways that you could possibly leverage it for its economic potential as well as its creative potential. So um, these conversations, you know, that we're about to start having, these webinars we're about to start having are, are intended to empower you and help you join the conversation about AI and hopefully um, take a seat at the table and uh, let people know what you think as, as an artist, as, a, as someone whose livelihood is being um, seriously impacted by these technologies. So we're really excited. This is our first webinar of, of the new iteration of the project. We are also hosting in-person events in Austin. So if you are a Austin area, Central Texas area creative out there in the audience, please follow us on our website. We do have a lot of in-person events coming up to build a community around this topic. Um, but we will also be hosting webinars on a regular basis as well. So um, tonight's, the, again, the first of that uh, sort of relaunch of the new iteration of the project. So very happy to have you here. Um, before I introduce our speaker, I'm gonna let you know that this is being recorded. So the link to the recording of the presentation will be posted on our resource YouTube channel. I'm gonna go ahead and drop the link to this um, YouTube channel here in the chat. Give me, bear with me one second. Um, if you're not subscribed to this channel, I would just encourage you to click subscribe so you get notifications anytime we upload a video. We're uploading recordings of our Austin events as well as the webinars and slowly um, adding some of our old ARP webinars as well that um, you might be interested in, the ones on grant writing and other things. So um, take a look at that um, resource YouTube channel. The recording will be posted there. After tonight's webinar, you will also get a link to digital copy of the slides. So don't feel like you have to feverishly take notes and, and take screenshots because um, you will be getting the slides afterwards. Um, but yeah, I want you to enjoy the conversation. There's gonna be a lot of time for Q&A at the end. And now is the time to introduce our panelists this evening, Sean Shan. I'm going to go ahead and pull him up on the screen. Um, we're very excited to have him with us. So um, Sean is a researcher at the computer science department at the University of Chicago. Um, he got his master's and his bachelor's in computer science, and his research focuses on understanding fundamental limitations of AI systems and protecting people from malicious uses of AI. He has um, published his work and been covered in media outlets such as the New York Times, BBC, NBC News, and MIT Tech Review. So we're very um, grateful to have him here. One of the things he's going to address toward the end of the talk is this um, technology that they're working on at University of Chicago called Glaze. And just a little bit about Glaze, if you haven't heard of it, it's a free tool that protects artists 
from generative AI mimicry by exploiting fundamental weaknesses in AI models. So Glaze, which was released only four months ago, has been downloaded over a million times by artists around the world, and it's been covered by major news outlets on every continent. So if you haven't heard about it, now's your chance to hear about it. Um, since its wide adoption, Glaze has helped reshape the conversation around generative AI between artists, curators, art schools, legislators, entertainment companies, and advocate groups. So very excited to hear more about that project as well. All right. So um, at any point tonight, if a question comes up, feel free to use the Q&A feature. We're going to save the questions to the end. Um, there are no good or bad questions. You don't need to be embarrassed. If you are embarrassed, put your name on the question. You can always check that anonymous box and we'll still answer it. So please post your questions as they arise. Um, we will address those at the end and uh, enjoy the presentation. I will pass it over to you, Sean. Thanks, Miranda, for the intro. Let me just share my screen. All right, can folks see this? All right, sounds good. One sec. All right. So uh, thanks, Miranda, for the intro. I'm very excited to talk to you about kind of the general generative AI space, as well as some of our work called Glaze, as Miranda mentioned, that try to really protect human artists against this rise of generative AI models. All right, so I'm gonna start the talk by showing you this cute picture, right? So on your right, you see a picture of uh, a baby peacock, right? So this was went viral on social media a couple of months ago. And if you right now, I did yesterday, if you go to this uh, Google search, you know, what does the baby peacock look like? And this will be one of the first images that turn up, right? Except that, you know, baby uh, peacocks in general, they don't, generally grow these type of pigments on their back until they're much older. And this image is in fact, actually AI generated image, what AI models think baby peacocks should look like, which is very different from the real one. And uh, so we see this happen quite a bit. So this, uh, another baby peacock image, another variant of baby peacock image that was on Adobe stock on Wikipedia, and uh, here, just another quick example. So I think many of us know about, you know, Iowa Hopper, famous American artist. So if you go to his Wikipedia page a couple months ago, you will see this very first painting that was claimed to be Iowa Hopper's painting and very much looks the same style as some of his, you know, iconic work. But in reality, this is also an AI generated image in the same style as, you know, Iowa Hopper. Right, so fortunately, somebody reported this, and Wikipedia took this down a couple months ago. So uh, uh, we are very much living uh, living this this world right now, where generative AI is all around us, whether we notice them or not. So I'm gonna talk today, uh, just first in general about these generative AI models, specifically the ones that can generate images. And then I'll talk about how these models really impact human artists in just the last year. And then for the second half, I will mention about, kind of talk about Glaze, how Glaze, what is Glaze and how Glaze work. And at the end, I will comment a little bit on kind of beyond Glaze, what are some other struggles human creativity is against journey by All right, so... To start, I want to mention that, uh, you know, we always talk about generative AI mostly in two contexts. One is text, you know, ChatGPT, uh, and BART and things like that, and image models, right, like stable diffusion and mid-journey. Right? So these two are actually very different, uh, just how these models actually work, how do they generate text or image, right? And they rely on very different models, very different architectures. So what is similar about these text and image model is that they are only possible, they're only made possible by learning from tons of data that are scraped on the internet, right? So for uh, the current kind of state of the art models, they more or less take all the possible images or text on the entire internet, right? So if, if you have a single image or some text online that is public viewable, it is very likely that image or text is already scraped, already trained into some of these models, right? So one uh, side effect of this, just want to quickly mention, 
is that for many popular texts or popular images, uh, the model overfit on them so that uh, they were able to rejuvenate the exact text or image, right? So for example, if you ask ChatGPT to generate the first paragraph of Harry Potter, which is copyrighted book, you will do so by, you know, generate word by word the Harry Potter book first paragraph, right? Similarly, same thing happens for images, for famous images and other things. So I want to kind of talk about uh, more specifically about these images models. So these models, they call diffusion model. If you search diffusion's model online, this is some of the pictures you see. And I think this is very hard to understand and not super useful. So today I'm going to try to offer a high level simplification of how these diffusion models work, right? How they generate images, how do they learn from these they call training data. So I'm going to do this by making an analogy uh, that compare how these models work to kind of the gravity of stars, right? So this is uh, overly simplification, may not be 100% correct, but hope this can help us understand, you know, how these models generate things. So let's say, you know, we have, you know, say this is the universe. We have this, uh, a star that correspond to Van Gogh style. Right, I'll explain what star is in a sec. And say we have, you know, a similar star corresponds to Picasso style nearby because they're, you know, fairly similar. So we'll have some other styles like Jackson Pollock, Greg Rowoski, that are a little bit further in this whole space. Now say we also, you know, the model also knows about dog, cats, and houses. So all, all the other objects are also in the same space, right? So I'm only showing only a small fraction of the stars. So each star corresponds to models understanding of what does this word, what, what does this object means, right? So Van Gogh style, the model kind of knows what does Van Gogh style look like. And the reason for that is, well, because it trained out hundreds and thousands of Van Gogh images, right? So it took thousand images, look at what Van Gogh style looked like and try to learn something from it. So it's not terribly surprising if you ask the model to generate image in Van Gogh style, you'll more or less generate this image, right? Similar image to some real Van Gogh paintings that already exist in the world, right? So this is not surprising, it's more or less just copying, right? And what is interesting is that models can also generate regions like here, right? So this is a red triangle region. So just assume this is, you know, the perfectly in between Van Gogh style and Picasso style, right? So in the history, there may not be exist a human artist that is you know, a 50-50 blend of Van Gogh and Picasso. But model is able to do this because you know, it learns uh, the mathematical understanding of Van Gogh and Picasso. It can easily just do 50%, 50%. So if you sample from this point, what you have is something like this, right? So you start to see kind of blend of Van Gogh style and Picasso style. So this, in some sense, uh, people are excited about this because this is now creating a new style, creating a new art style that doesn't exist before, right? So that's kind of the power or the interesting piece of these generative AI models. Uh, technically, this is called interpolation. Is you know, model not only learns what exists, but kind of interpolate what is you know in between different things and can generate like a merge style like this, right? So similarly, you can have a Van Gogh style dog correspond to this right triangle look something like this, pretty sure Van Gogh never draw a dog before, but I think, you know, the model have seen enough Van Gogh images to know what it looks like, seen enough dog images what it looks like, and then can merge these two in the model's understanding in the model space, right? So similarly, you have Picasso style dog, you can also have a dog that is a blend between Van Gogh style and Picasso style, for example. All right, so this is kind of a very high level how this model works and why it is able to generate interesting images or interesting art style that never exists before, right? It is by leveraging existing style as kind of anchor points and just interpolate throughout this space. All right, so now a follow up on this is the natural question is, you know, well, what happens to my artwork if say the models train on my artwork? So what has happened to it, right? So let's say, uh, I have this painting online, say this is a watercolor painting of a river that I post on my website. And 
So the question is, you know, what happens to the model if it trains on this single piece of art? So what you will do is first, uh, you will take a look at, okay, this is watercolor and the river. So we'll put the image somewhere in the region of sphere. Right now the model knows, okay, so watercolor, a river looks something like this. But we'll update its understanding of the concept watercolor as well as the concept of river. Now, after you train on this, uh, this single piece of art, so you next time you ask the model to generate another watercolor dog, for example, or a Van Gogh style river, the model's uh, kind of ability to generate this image changes slightly based on the single piece of image. Right. So, and get for uh, common topics like watercolors or river, there are thousands or millions of images that correspond to these uh, prompts. So a single piece of image may have very small impact on just how the model will generate watercolor images, but they will have an impact. And together, that's how the model has a very good understanding what, of what, what watercolor means. Right, so again, this is a very high level simplification of how this model works. And there are some more technical details that are not super important to understand. So, uh, now, coming back a little bit on this, so we, uh, for these models, uh, we really see really a third of all these models early last year, lately in March last year, there are a lot of these diffusion models, generative AI models came out. And I want to just show this plot that really shows kind of how fast the generative AI space has moved. Right, so we'll take the example of mid-journey. So mid-journey, uh, for folks not familiar, is one of the more popular uh, tool that people use to generate AI art. And over the last uh, 13 months, it has five different versions. So each later version worked a little bit better than the previous version. So I went back in time, asked each version to generate the same image or the same prompt. Right. So these are the first three images generated by the first three version. Right. It doesn't look uh, too good. And then these are the images generated by version four and five. Right. So you see there's a clear improvement uh, from version three to version four. And version five are just kind of mind blowing at this point. Right, so we want to remind you that from version one to version five, we only take 13 months of this time. And so this is March this year, and this is the model are still getting updated. I think they have 5.1 right now, but the model are still getting updated. There are more training data coming in. People are building smarter ways to build these models so that it works better, work faster. So here are some other images uh, generated to show kind of the variety of style, variety of object that these models can capture. And also this is an interesting example. So this was actually an ad on, on Twitter. I actually saw this on my own Twitter feed. So if you click into this, you see some you know, beautiful lamps that people sell for around 20 to 30 bucks. Right? But the problem is these lamps never existed, right? These are actually AI generated lamps uh, that worked as a scam for people to buy them online. So these are some examples of how kind of uh, AI generated images and the quality. Uh, kind of want to mention, you know, why is AI art or generative AI at this moment so controversial? Right? I think most of us know about this. Is these models are you know only made possible or only made possible to you know have such high quality? with the help of thousands or millions of images on the entire internet. And many of these images, they do not have you know, the right or the copyright to use to train a model like this. Right? So I think the discussion around copyright is a little bit blurry, so I'm not gonna comment too much on this. So there are uh, currently many lawsuits and class action lawsuits in the progress to talk about you know, whether using these images to train the model is a fair use because you know human learns similarly and arguments like this. But overall today, uh, this is what happening. People take images online without artist consent and train them into these models and more or less with the goal of replacing existing artists. So I'm gonna uh, make this discussion a little bit concrete on kind of how AI art impacts specific artists or individual artists. I'm gonna follow the story of an artist I work with, uh, Kelly McKernan. So Kelly is 
uh, has always been passionate about art. So these are some of her early uh, her early on drawings. So over time, Kelly started to have her, her own style, getting featured in galleries, you know, become semi professional. And today, Kelly is a full time independent artist. Right, that means she makes most of her income through creating and selling her art. So, uh, as, as you you know may know about this, you know, in order to be successful as at the art business, what you need to do is to upload a lot of sample art online, right, on your Instagram, on your website, in order to attract commissions and sell prints. Right, so all of these are going smoothly. Until last year, uh, Kelly realized that fifty of her paintings are scraped into the Lion Five B datasets. Right, of course, she's not aware of this, and there's no composition or credits given to her. And the result of this is not only the models who train on these data sets are able to generate pretty art with the help of Kelly's images, but they are also able to copy or mimic the exact style or exact artistic style. Right? So if you ask the model to generate images, say in the style of Kelly McKernan, so you will generate these images very much in the same style. And these are some other examples of synthetic images uh, mimicking Kelly's style by using Kelly's name as a part of the prompt. Right, so this type of kind of style mimicry has happened to tons of artists. And in fact, it today even becomes the industry itself. Right, so today there are entire online marketplaces where AI enthusiasts will target specific artists by kind of building a style mimicry model on the art of a given artist and upload these model online. And with the purpose of kind of replace these human artists in the real world. And kind of the ironic part of uh, this entire place is that they also ask for donations, right? They want to get compensated for training a model for a couple hours and put them online. So as you can imagine, style mimicry probably has huge damage to the entire artist uh, community, right? Not only to their income, but also their livelihood. So we went out to did a user study with over 1,200 professional artists early this year. As you know, from some of the artists we talked to, many has already stopped promoting art online, getting replaced by these models, and also are considering quitting art because they feel so depressed. And all of these are especially true for younger students, for junior artists. And of course, this is not just in our study. We see this all over the internet where companies replacing human with AI and artists quitting uh, around the world. And I want to bring your attention to this one. So this one was uh, very recent, I think it was in July. There was a Japanese art student who was so depressed about the entire AI situation. So he attempted self-harm. Right, so now for the rest of this talk, uh, I want to talk about Glaze. Uh, it's our effort that try, try really try to protect human artists against this type of style mimicry. And I will uh, talk about how it works and then also talk about you know, our experience of deploying this to artist community and some lessons learned throughout this process. So I'm going to start this with, uh, you know, how do we get involved in this, right? So we're not artists, we're researchers studying kind of computer science. So we actually got involved in the space um, where artists first reached out to us, right? So we got an email from artists uh, through some prior work we did asking us for help, right? See whether some technology can protect them against AI system to copy their arts. And from there, we get invited to attend this online town hall organized by the Concept Art Association, where we really can understand how to learn about how AI has impact artist artist life. So from early on, we decided that you know if we were to do anything in this space, if we were to build a protection tool, we have to work with artists, right? Because we are not artists, we cannot decide what they need. So we start working with uh, different artists, doing user studies, doing interviews, and using these feedbacks, uh, we build the Glaze protection tool. And the news on this got out early March. So we talked to New York Times and a couple other outlets. And we released the beta version of the tool uh, in March early this year. And as Miranda mentioned, we got around 1 million downloads as of July 2023. All right. So what is Glaze? So when 
Uh, so when there's no protection or no glaze, uh, what happened today is, you know, anybody can go to an artist's website, take a couple images, and build a style mimicry model. Right? And these models will be able to generate these synthetic images on the right that pretty much copy the same style as the original artist, but it's completely new art. Uh, you can generate arbitrary objects. Now, with glaze, what he does is before artists post their artwork online, they will put the art through glaze, and glaze will take a look at this art and add in some small modification to different regions of the art right, at the pixel level. And these small perturbations are more or less invisible to human eyes, but are designed to fool these generation models. Right, so I'll explain how they do this and why it works. But uh, now, after you glaze your art, if somebody were to do the exact same style mimicry on these glazed art pieces, the model will actually learn a different art style or a different art you know, genre from compared to the original artist. Right, so we'll learn the wrong style so that original art style will be protected. As you can imagine, if you know you run all your artwork through Glaze, post them online, the model will not be able to copy your style, but copy some random, say, Mongol style, so it's not very effective. Right, so give you a quick example. So this is uh, the Musa Victoria painting from Carla Ortiz. Uh, so Carla worked with us on this. And so this is, is the original Carlos uh, painting, and this is the glazed version of the same painting. So it looks very much the same, but you can see there are some uh, some small differences if you zoom in to, uh, to some of the regions. And if you ask AI model, what do you think about this art? The AI model will think the original art as oil painting, as brush style, which is the, you know, which is correct. If I ask the AI model, what do you think about the second piece, which is glaze, you will think to be something completely different, right? You may think as more than abstract. So if you were to copy the style of the glaze artwork, it will actually copy something completely different and the Carla style, uh, Carla's own style is, is kind of safe from the AI attack. Right, so why this work? I'm gonna get a little bit technical on this. Uh, so, uh, so when machine sees pieces of art and human sees pieces of art, they use very different the technique where we have very different perceptions, right? We humans see things in, as patterns, as colors, but machines simply see as, you know, a list of pixel values for each of the images, right? It's also a task to generate a, a list of pixel values. That's all machines see. Right, because of this, uh, there is a fundamental gap between human perception and machine perception. And then what we can do is we can maximize this gap. We can find some small changes that is barely visible to human eyes, but will have a huge impact on how AI understands a specific piece of art. Right, so this is not really a watermark. It's not really a hidden message. So I think the best analogy is uh, kind of UV light, right? So if you know we see things normally, or if we open the UV light, we'll see a lot of different things that you know are not visible to human perception. So we can think AI see these images using a UV light, right? Some dimension that is completely different how us humans see things. So what we can do with glaze is we can add a lot of changes in the UV dimension, which human cannot see is more or less invisible to human eye. But to the machine, there is a huge amount of changes added so that you, know, you will not be able to understand or copy the original art style. All right, so another uh, piece to this is glaze is integrated to the art. So it's actually very challenging to isolate these changes added, you know, through frequencies or color or position. So glaze is actually pretty hard uh, to remove from a from a given image. Right, so this is how kind of a high level how glaze work, and there are some more specific technique. So I just want to mention that this type of fundamental gap exists in many different AI models. This has been observed uh, for probably a decade already. And there are 
kind of a lot of research into explaining why these you know small changes exist that can disrupt the models. And it, at this point, I think the researchers has agreed this is something fundamental to the models, so which means it's fairly hard for model to you know evolve beyond this or also try to you know be robust against changes like this. All right, so here are some examples. So here are uh, original art pieces from three different artists. And here are, you know, if you mimic the art without any protection, right? These are AI generated artwork when the artist does not use any protection. And on the right are AI generated artwork if uh, the artist use glaze to protect their original art pieces, right? So you can see much difference from the original art style generate something that's completely different. We also test uh, Glaze against many of the online tools that does mimicry as a service and show that it's effective. We also test Glaze against uh, many type of countermeasures that you know, AI enthusiasts can deploy to try to bypass Glaze. So once we built Glaze uh, back in March, we uh, decided to release this as a free tool for artists. So you can go uh, uh, go to our website, download this, and it runs locally on your Mac and Windows. And so the original tweet went pretty viral from uh, my advisor. We got around uh, also 1 million app downloads in just, I think, five months. And I think last two months ago, we released a web version of Glaze so that it does not use any compute on your own machine, but if you just you know sign up our web Glaze account. So some of the initial feedback, so we receive uh, tons of uh, positive response from artists. And right now we are working with a group of professional artists uh, around the world who help us, you know, from designing the app UI to film YouTube videos and to you know, include Glaze as part of a campaign against you know, the use of generative AI. And uh, beyond individual artists, uh, we're also speaking to gaming companies, our platforms who are interested in kind of integrate Glaze or use Glaze to protect their own IP or to protect their own copyright. Right, so uh, we also start to see there are follow-up work from different research groups from other universities I try to look at you know glades for other modality, right? How do you protect your writing style from ChatGPT? How do you protect your voice against Eleven Labs and things like that? But I want to mention uh, that despite all these uh, benefits, Glaze does have uh, limitations, right? It is not designed as you know a permanent solution that will you know solve all the AI problem. It is more a stopping gap, as something that will that will work before other regulations and policy in the kind of generative AI space catch up that will really kind of enforce some of the copyrights uh, laws. And, uh, but despite this, uh, this is Glaze. We see this as only one of the beginnings, right? This is very new, generative AI is very new and Glaze is very new. So we are seeing many other tools uh, emerge as well. So Mist uh, is very similar to Glaze. They also release uh, their tool online. There are also other tools like PhotoGuard from MIT that try to disrupt uh, generative AI's ability to do in painting. And more broadly, there are a lot of research right now looking into you know how do we recognize how do we detect AI generated content from you know authentic content and things like reliable watermark and also tracing provenance of image, which means, you know, if uh, whether I know for sure AI is trained on my image or not. Right? So all of these are still fairly early stage. Uh, we see a lot of, you know, academic research paper in the space. Uh, so, I will, you know, expect the, the deployable kind of tools or real world use cases of these will coming up in the near future. So in the end, I just want to comment a little bit uh, on the bigger picture, right? So our discussion is more on human artists and, and generative AI models. But we also see this bigger ongoing fight between human, kind of human creativity at large against generative AI, right? We see this entire hollow was on strike. A centerpiece of uh, the disagreement between you know, actors, writers, and studios 
is that whether studios can use AI models to replace these human creators. And oftentimes, the models are trained or built from kind of the content generated from these creators. We also see many senior hearing on this, many kind of legislative discussion are, you know, out on discussing whether we should enforce a certain copyright law on AI generated images. So this is a very complex space. Uh, we are trying to share our perspective uh, in this space as well. So like this one, we are speaking to different artists and creator uh, unions and guilds about Glaze, about you know, sharing the technical details about these models. We're engaged with uh, activists, Eclair in the EU. So Eclair is this powerhouse that is behind many of the recent AI regulations in the EU. Back in the US, we're speaking to the US Copyright Office, as well as many other legislators about you know, the use of copy, uh, the use of generative AI and the impact on artists. So with this, I'm gonna end this talk, uh, leave you with some pictures protected by Glaze. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Sean, um, for all this information. Um, if you do have a question, feel free to drop it in the Q&A or chat. I've see, I see a couple have come in, and we also had some submitted uh, during registration process. If we have time, we can look at those as well. Um, you had a slide that was talking about some of the other um, softwares being developed to protect artists. And I think people are interested in which disciplines, which artistic disciplines are, are those tools. Um, used for. I see. Yeah. Uh, so at the, okay. So I think there are uh, existing tools that are released are mostly on images. So it's only for visual artists, digital artists, photographers. And there are kind of, uh, I think there are not, there are some work in progress that are trying to work to protect videos. So, you know, animations potentially or game sequences. And there is, uh, I'm aware there was some research uh, work on developing a system to protect uh, human voices where voice actors found their voice being mimicked from these models. So I think we'll see more of these coming up. There are research papers, but also I think for real world usage tools, it takes a little bit longer just because you know, we need to actually deploy and build a tool. Uh, so I think we'll likely see more of this coming up uh, very soon because we already started to see a lot more research paper in this space. I know you have the background knowledge and, and of these things coming up because you are yourself a researcher, but how can our audience um, stay updated about the developments? Like what, where should they be following? What should they be looking at as these tools come out? Oh, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, well. Uh, you could follow, you know, the Glaze Twitter handle. We, so my advisor and I, we managed uh, the Glaze Twitter handle. Which, if you search Glaze, let me let me just pull it up in case. So, because there are a, co a couple copycats that try to pretend to be Glaze. This one. All right. So this is uh, the Glaze handle. Uh, I'm not sure how do I post this. Uh. But I think I only post to you. I'm not sure I would be able to okay. post to the entire audience, but yeah, you can forward that. But yeah, so I think my advisor and I uh, run the Glaze kind of Twitter handle where we um, be fairly kind of commentary on all the developments. So we retweet all the artists and the crazy stuff that these companies are doing, as well as other tools that, you know, come up, uh, other research that come up in the space. So yeah, so you can follow that. But also I think, uh, there are several artists that are very active in the space, right? So we have Carla Ortiz, who is leading the class action lawsuits, and a couple other kind of uh, artists who has a pretty good understanding of how these models work. So they also kind of are pretty active on Twitter as well. So if you follow Blaze, we oftentimes retweet uh, what those artists uh, you know mention, so you can follow them as well. Great, that's good to know. If if so, if you're on Twitter, I, I posted it in the chat. It's at the Glaze Project. Um, 
Sean assures us that he'll he'll keep you posted on any new tools that are being developed. And I mean, this is kind of how it works. It, it, you know, it comes out of academia. It's free. Um, the insiders are are uh, are aware of the knowledge, but maybe not the general public. So it is kind of slow to develop. So I do encourage you, you know, if you're interested in this, to um, you know follow their Twitter or um, reach out to Sean. He might be able to point you in the right direction. Um, yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. There are some questions about how do we know if our artwork has been trained by AI? I know you said there's some tools being developed. I personally have heard of a website, haveibeentrained.com. Um, do you know anything other than that? So the, yeah, so, uh, yeah, so this is overall, I think first, this is a very complex issue to actually identify whether our work has been trained. And the reason it's just because they are trained on so many, you know, images, right? It's almost like they're stealing from us too much. So we don't even know whether they're stealing from me personally. But so for the have I been trained .com, uh, it is basically a scan of the data sets that these AI company uh, claim they have used, right? So there are a couple, you know, open source or public data set these company claim that used to train the models. So they basically see, oh, okay, whether your art is in that data set. It probably works well until last year, because right now the AI company no longer leverage these public data set. They start to collect their own data. It's unclear, you know, what data they're using in their kind of research paper. They always say oh, we're using an internal project, internal data sets. So we suspect it's probably a little bit different. They are perhaps more aggressive at scraping the internet compared to the ones that are posted online. So in general, I think identify whether your image is being trained is very challenging. And unless you know you have a very specific style or your image become very popular, so they're you know getting trained into the model multiple times, you can start seeing there are some trends uh, on that. So yeah. All right, thanks. Thank you for that. Um, other questions? Um... Do you know of any AI companies that are trying to be more ethical in their training process? Um, and I think this relates to another question that was asked um, in the registration process, um, kind of how can artists be ethical if they want to use AI right now when these, uh, you know, the training itself hasn't utilized ethical processes. Mm -hmm. So um, are there any companies you might suggest one or the other or ways that artists could try to be ethical in their use? Yeah, so absolutely. So uh, so to the first question, I think overall, uh, there are companies that are trying to be ethical. I think there is many companies, many of these companies are more or less pretending to be ethical in order to, you know, just gain trust, to gain, you know, uh, you know, to, to compete with other competitors. So one example is the Adobe Firefly. So if you search Adobe Firefly, it is, you know, one of the first things they brand themselves about is, you know, it's an ethical model. It's very different from how, you know, stable diffusion, the journey are trained. Uh, so I think back in the, when you first released, artists are really excited about it. Uh, but I think when people start to digging a little bit deeper inside, it's actually not as ethical as they claimed. Right? So one of the things is that they claim they only train on Adobe stock image. And so later on, there are a bunch of stock image contributors said they never gave consent to you know training for AI model. And Adobe actually updated their term of service after they released the model, saying, oh, now the term of service is stock images can be trained into AI, right? So it's very unclear whether you know that count as ethical if you do something like this. And there are a couple other companies, uh, intentionally or unintentionally. Uh, failed to be ethical in the space, right? So there is a company uh, that tried to, you know, build ethical models and they did this by training only on the images output by Midjourney, right? So they asked Midjourney to output tons of images and only turn on those images. So, so you know, it's very clear that since Midjourney is not ethical, is the image generated is not terribly ethical. So the model that they have should also not be ethical. So I think there are quite a few attempts in the space, but overall, I think it is very challenging even, you know, someone were to build an ethical model, right? The reason for this is just because these models do need a tons of training data, 
in order to function well, right? It's very hard for anybody or any companies to get, you know, billions of high quality artwork and make sure each single one of them, they have the copyright, they have the rights to train. So I think overall, uh, I don't see any good model today as, uh, you know, was able to be ethical and also achieve high performance at the same time. I think people are start to solve this problem. I think in the tech space, I'm aware there was, I think somebody tried to train a model only on you know, open access legal cases, because I think that's you know the, more or less the only thing you can train on that has the full copyright to, uh, to do so. And they show the model does not work really well beyond you know, generating legal cases. So I think overall, this is challenging problem that companies and researchers are trying to solve. Uh, but also, I think there is some kind of bottleneck on, you know, they do need thousands or millions or hundreds of millions of images to function well. And, you know, how do they get them on image and copyright is very challenging. So. And, okay, and, and this is kind of to the first question. And to the second question, I think, you know, whether artists can use uh, generative AI, even, uh, you know, knowing that these models are not ethical, they, can they use it ethically? I think at this point is is challenging. I think related to kind of the answer for the first question, uh, but I think there are other AI tools that are not as you know advanced. They don't fill the entire image for you. They are able to generate kind of sketches where they're only able to fill some pieces or using some interesting kind of transformations. So those tools are generally more ethical than kind of these these AI models that directly output the full images for you. But I think overall you know, they will diffusion these models that are just not ethical at all. And it's very challenging to, you know, segment the ethical portion out of it. I see. Um, moving on, we do have some very activist minded uh, people in our community, artist community. So I think um, people are interested in how do they find out about what are the class action suits going on right now, especially with individual fine artists. Um, and also you mentioned you were a part of some sort of movement. I, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, like what movements maybe right. people could join if they really want to be a part of the, you know, the, the, the grassroots sort of uh, uh, protests against this stuff. Yeah, absolutely. So I think, uh, for the class action lawsuits, I think they have their uh, website to search about, you know, class action lawsuit against stable diffusion and the journey. They, they have a website, I'm sure they have probably some info where artists can input. And I think in, in generally, so I mostly talk to people in the EU and, uh, and, and US. So for the US, I think the FTC, so it's the Federal Trade Commission, so they they are in the space of kind of enforcing some regulations on these AI companies. So back, I think in a couple months ago, they put out kind of asking for opinion kind of form where if you are a human artist, you can submit, you know, how AI has to impact your, you know, your life and that PC will take a look at that and potentially enforce certain laws on these companies. I think, I'm not sure whether that form is still open, but I think, there are a couple of similar actions ongoing and uh, not even just at federal level, I think at state level, we're talking in Illinois, we have some kind of privacy laws. Uh, there are some, you know, legislator was talking to us about, you know, potentially enforcing this using some of the privacy laws. So I think there are a lot of discussion on this. So one of the things you can do is to look out for some of the form asking for opinions. But also I think for a concept art association, they are pretty active in the space. So uh, I think if you follow the Grace Twitter, I think sometimes they post some of these forms or some of the uh, resources on this as well. And I think for EU, Eclair is one of the big activist groups. I think EU in generally the regulation is a lot better compared to the US. Uh, so I think, it, I'm not sure about the specifics in the EU, but I think there probably are similar forms or similar actions that you can potentially join. So Glare should be a you know good place to start uh, on this. As for some other countries, I think I'm aware that Asia or like Japan or some other countries are more aggressive 
towards human creators. They are more kind of, you know, investing in the next wave of AI technology type of mindset. So it's a little bit harder, but we'll hope that, you know, what actions in the US and EU can have a bigger impact globally like that. Yeah, I do. I do believe you are correct in saying that things are moving a little bit faster in the EU. Um, if if this is something you're interested in, the case is, I will say that next week we're having uh, an international lawyer who specializes in copyright and AI um, deliver a webinar that's on Tuesday. I dropped the link in the chat. I can drop it again at the end um, in case you missed it. But um, they'll know more about the international policies and what's happening. There have been some major cases um, that have determined certain things here in the US, but it is, you know, from an overall perspective, moving very slowly. And <laughs> it's because now's the time to monetize, right? So um, things are just moving really slowly in terms of regulation. Um, but yeah, so here on this slide is some, some, some good things to look into if you wanna see who's doing what. Um, let me see the other questions. I think we're some of the other questions are going back to the tools to protect. So we've we've focused on visual arts. Do you know of anything specifically for video to protect video? And honestly, I'm wondering, is video at risk right now? Because I most of the AI tools I know are actually generating video from generated images. I don't know if are they generating video from video at this point? Right. So I think, yeah, I think uh, currently you're correct. I think these models, uh, you see some of the models are able to generate videos, some are able to generate 3D, you know, mesh of certain objects. Uh, currently, they are mostly rely on, or, you know, rely on versions of image models to generate images first, and they do certain tricks to make into video and things like that. But what I'm gonna say is, I there is a movement. There are a lot of kind of state of the art researchers looking into how to leverage existing videos to make them generate a lot better, right? So currently, if you look at AI generated videos, they are normally very short, and the quality are fairly low compared to AI generated images. So I wouldn't be surprised if you know in the next year or so there will be tools that will be able to generate you know long sequence of done dance or long sequence of animations. Uh, using existing dance videos or animation video that's you know uh, available online. So I think currently uh, there is not specific tool that protect videos. Uh, you know, one of the things you can do with glaze is you just glaze every single frame of the video, which will you know take a long time, but that may work well against uh, some of these models. So we uh, actually are looking to kind of follow up work in extending glaze to video potentially. You know, have something more general. Uh, that, that kind of go beyond just glazing every single frame uh, of a video. So probably gonna take a little bit on, on developing some of this, but also kind of on the other side, the technology on copying video will also take some time to catch up as well. We did have a question submitted during the registration process that was asking, is there any art form that's more at risk than an, another art form. Um, I know we keep coming back to image generators, but um, I've heard from writers as well, you know, that um, it's completely full chunks of their, their writing being plagiarized. Um, but do you have any in, insider's knowledge about which artistic disciplines are, are most at risk right now? Yeah, I think write, writing is perhaps the hardest. I think, you know, we're thinking, you know, can we apply plays to, to writing? It is very challenging. And the reason is simply because, you know, for art, you can hide a lot of information in the pixel level. You change some small pixels, nothing really, you know, obvious to human eyes. But you can't really do that to writing, right? Sure, you can, you know, edit the sentence a little bit in different ways, but there, the space, there's only so much space you can do. So protecting writing is very challenging. And also similarly, protecting voices will be uh, harder than images. Uh, and this is because the kind of the mimicry scenario is a little bit different is for many cases, voice actor, they don't have the copyright of their own voice. They go to a studio, record and leave with nothing, right? The studio will keep a copy, keep everything. So it's very challenging for, you know, voice actors to protect their voice using a tool like Glaze. So we think for those super challenging cases, perhaps we will have to rely on, you know, some of the regulations or legal actions to catch up 
to make difference in that space. Yeah, thank you for bringing that up because um, we do have a lot of different disciplines represented in in our artist community. Um, I did want to, you to talk a little bit about um, the monetization of Glaze. You said it's free, but that you know people really want to know: do you do you have any plans to to monetize it, or is it going to remain free? Are you going to get people on board, and then later they have to pay? What, do you know long term plans with this tool? Uh, yeah, so we will always remain free uh, with this tool. We will also uh, bring continuous updates. So we so we are like a research group. So we are academics. So we're not you know startups. We're not companies. So we do this for research, right? To understand how AI impact people. We write research paper out of it, as well as you know build this tool like this. So we are. I just kind of relate. I was mentioning that we are working a lot more follow up in the space, right? So we recently hired a lot more people in the space to work on making Glaze more robust, more usable to artists, but also, you know, Glaze for videos and, you know, tracking image provenance and many different projects was uh, was ongoing. We're also kind of looking at, you know, how do you detect AI general images and, and things like that. So I think we are, you know, very invested in this entire space, but it will remain free as a tool you know, for artists to use. And, you know, just to put that out there, even though you're free, you know, I'm sure someone's going to come up with a copycat and try to make money off of this. So there's yeah. always that risk as well. <laughs> um, so someone's asking, where do we find the Glades tool? I did post a link, but is there a better link that you have to go to find Glaze? Uh, uh, I think just Glaze uh, as, okay, just... I think it should be the same. Oh, if you go to the Twitter, I think we link there. Just glaze, glaze.cs.uchicago.edu, just our website. Okay. Yeah. I think yeah. So there's but yeah, bunch of information on there, some Q and A's and some updates as well. Yeah, I think I I think that's what I posted was the glaze.cs.uchicago.edu. Yeah. Yep. That one, yeah. Um, so you can find information there and how to download it. Can you talk a little bit about um? Uh, the limitations a little bit more of the tool so they know so the artists know exactly what um, they can expect it to do and what they can expect but also maybe some of the technological requirements because right now you're saying it's downloadable and they have to use it is it through a browser it's not quite an app yet is that is that correct uh, no so we have uh, the app so if you have windows or uh, macbook you just it's just you just normal app that you open uh, so you kind of select image on your uh, on your uh, on your local disk and it will start generating glaze versions of it so it takes quite a, some times for it to work on just average consumer uh, you know laptops or pcs so it takes around 20 minutes more to generate a single piece of glaze image uh, so that's kind of why we did uh, the web glaze. So web glaze is basically a tool where uh, you don't use your resources. You upload image to our server, will run on GPUs, and then we'll return the glazed version of the image uh, you know, back to your email. So we have that as well. So currently the web glaze, uh, in order to get access to that, you just send an email to uh, our email, say you want access to uh, to web glaze we'll send you an invite so we do this just to make sure that ai bros doesn't you know offload our our server with random images so yeah so currently you can do uh do either if you don't want your image ever leave your machine then you can use the app version but if you, you know, want you don't have enough resources you can do uh use the version that we have uh, called web glaze and what kind of turnaround time is it uh, on the the web glaze? A uh, web glaze is much faster. It takes like five minutes. Well, it depends on whether there are a lot of people use it. But I think normally just take average of five minutes, so you'll get an email. Exactly. So I mean, yeah, five five to five minutes web glaze, twenty minutes if you're using your your device. Um, to, can you talk a little bit about how, how artists are using this? Like, are you having people send in lots and lots of images or are they just reserving it maybe for just their special things that they want to post? Uh, so, yeah, so we actually built kind of the app version first. We're saying, okay, we're going to be, uh, you know, very privacy respectful, nothing going to send to our server. We don't want to take any responsibility. 
So we did that. It was great. Many artists, let's say many artists has GPU on their PCs because, you know, they do our rendering. So that was fine. I think until <laughs> there are a lot of people emailing us from a little bit low income or junior artists or our students who, you know, barely even have a PC laptop. So they ask, okay, how can I glaze this if I don't have a laptop or things like this? So, and, and we think that population of people who has, you know, less resources are the ones perhaps impact more by a tool like AI. So we then, so we decided to do the web glaze. So we built the web glaze, which is identical as uh, the software you will run, except it runs on our GPUs. So it will be much faster to render a single piece of art. Yeah, and and just to clarify again, where can they find that email to request the web glaze? Is it that same website? Uh, yeah, I think there should be an email somewhere to uh see email. If you go to the feedback, there's a there should be an email. Uh, one sec. Um. Okay, so. Wait, let me just post this email here. To be all right, let me send the email out here. I said we post the email somewhere in this it's a Google group email. Let me send to you. So this is the uh glaze email, I think it was on Twitter or something. Okay. But if you just send an email to us, but also kind of like a little bit to show that you are a human artist and maybe a link to a portfolio, then we can know it's not, you know. AI people who want to uh, offload our server and things like that. <laughs> yeah, we're <laughs> yeah we we had that happen uh, when we first released it, so we're like, oh, a little bit more careful now. I I'm enjoying the, uh, the I can tell that this is in the very early stages um, of of development. It's it's interesting having people actually email. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> I think, yeah, I think we, I mean, we normally are research groups, so, you know, we publish papers, so other people build tools on top of our paper normally are, are a case like this. But in this case, you know, things are moving so fast and, and from the people we talk to, it's all, oh my God, this is, you know, an actual problem that we have to do something in this space. So we put ourselves <laughs> in this space, kind of building a tool, actually deploying it. So there are a lot of kind of hiccups throughout this process, but I think overall it has been really positive. So. Awesome. Um, I don't see any more questions. If questions come up, please, please type them in. Um, I'm actually going to uh, uh, maybe pause your, your, your uh, screen share for a minute. Okay. Let me and, yeah. So I'd like to know, um, just because you're a researcher, so you have a lot of background knowledge um, and you've talked to a lot of artists. Um, tell us, like, you specialize in in privacy, is that correct? AI and privacy. What tell tell us a little bit more about your research, and then I also want to know like what's the the most fascinating thing you've found out um, in the past six months talking to artists. Yeah, I think so. One of okay, so my research. Uh, so I so I got my uh, B uh, bachelor and master in uh, computer science, and I mentioned. So I'm currently doing a PhD. So this is my kind of a uh, PhD research, uh, me and my wife that are working on uh, in the space. So we normally work in the space called security and privacy, right? So we work on kind of protecting human from malware. We look at, you know, privacy problems, so face recognition, you know, these face recognition system can scrape your data online and start recognizing you on the streets and things like that. So we, you know, understand why this happens and try to build tools to stop these AI models uh, uh, from doing these type of things, right? So this kind of requires us to have a pretty good understanding of how these models works and how these models are trained. So this is kind of my uh, my background. And right now after Glaze, which really has been, uh, you know, very big and positive. So I'm going to share my gear a little bit more towards kind of just protecting human creativity against uh, the rise of generative AI. I think we really believe that generative AI as its current form is not very beneficial for creativity. So we're trying to, you know, change that at least, whether making that, you know, a positive saying or really try to make a stop on how generative AI are impact kind of human creativity right now. So that's kind of uh, my research. Uh, I think my, you know, most interesting thing I heard from artists 
Oh, that's a good question. I think, I think to be honest, the most surprising thing is perhaps the first, one of the first conversation we had with artists. So like once we attend this online town hall, we're like, okay, we can potentially help with this technology. So we start calling, uh, scheduling some interview with uh, individual artists. I think just just the sheer amount of interest in a technology like this as this, you know, in current form was just really mind blowing. I, I remember, I think I was, we are talking to, I forgot whether it's Carla Ortiz or, or one of the other artists, but they are very excited. I uh, thinking this will, you know, at least make some positive impacts uh, in this whole space. I remember me and my advisor, normally we you know, do research, publish paper and do next research, publish next paper. But once we jump out of that call, we're like, oh my God, there's so much nerve, so much pressure on us. I'm building a tool like this and there's so many things can go wrong and so many things did kind of went wrong, some of the small things. So yeah, so I think uh, it has just been really surprising to see people are interested in the tool and really are impacted by, you know, journey to models like that. <laughs> you you got yourself into something much bigger than you thought it was going to be, huh? Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> right place, right time. That's yep, that is hard. absolutely true. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's that's great that you guys are working on this um, and, and happy to, to promote it. Um, the face recognition part sounds scarier to me than the art scraping and we just had a question come in is there something out there to disrupt that um scraping of photos or facial recognition for privacy is, do you know of something yes <laughs> so okay let me uh so we actually did a project called uh fox uh let me send the website this is back in 2020 uh okay is there a way i can okay so i think this is a website so uh wait uh i think i mixed types of one sec oh, here we go okay it's a little bit sorry it was a wrong link here we go yeah so uh, so we actually started with looking at face recognition uh where we started to see a lot of reports i think in 2020 where companies uh, there's a company called clearview.ai where they're building basically mass scale face recognition system without any consent, right? So they go on uh, your Facebook, on Instagram, scrape every single face image they can possibly find, as well as you know your name on Facebook, and they build their model. And what they can do is, if you walk on the street, uh, you know, get get shot, uh, get you know, a headshot from any of the civilians camera, they will be able to track you with just a single image, right? So this, you know, some of the positive argument of this is, you know, used for law enforcement. But I think one pretty famous incident is there was, you know, a mass shooter was identified just instantly back to uh, a image he posts when he was in Las Vegas, but it's not even his image, it's somebody else's image. He was just on the very back of this image in the background. And they were able to track that specific image, find his identity, and arrest him, right? So this is arguably an okay use case. But since then, that private company has been, you know, doing a little bit more, uh, you know, less good things. I think they have been used that for mass surveillance, for, you know, for other people to stalk on um, different people and places that once. So the Clearview AI has just a huge privacy concern that a lot of people have, and ex especially many of the data they collected is, you know, similar to the R case, it's basically not consensual, right? When I post images on Facebook, I don't consent on training these images in big, scary AI models. And so we did the Fox paper, which is uh, rely on very similar techniques as what we did with Glaze is, you know, before you post your images on Facebook, you add in some small changes to the image. So that will look like something totally different, some one totally different, right? So even you uh, learn that I look like this, but when I go outside, it's my real face. You will not be able to track my real face back to you know my identity on Facebook. So that was kind of the project we did. You also got some attention. I think we're also covering New York time on that. Uh, so this actually was a project that got uh, people interesting. Well, get we started on Glaze. So we had a mailing list for Fox. So people you know ask questions about how to install the tool and things like that. 
And I think last year in uh, in July, we just got an email from the artist, as I showed in the slides before, asking, oh, can we use this to protect art? I think at that point, we're like, what do you mean protecting art? <laughs> and, and then I think that was just when Daddy 2 came out. And we start to see more and more of the scary kind of news articles on you know, artists getting copied and getting attacked by these models. So, so, so then we start, you know, working on a similar tool that's designed for, you know, artists. Wow, that's a really interesting backstory. Um, and uh, yeah, that link is in, in for the Fox that he keeps mentioning is in the chat. If you, if you guys want to access that, it's, it's not Fox like the animal FOX, it's F-A-W-K-E-S, Fox. Um, but is that is that still available as well? So yeah, so that is uh, also a tool available that you can download to Glade or to Fox, adding uh, changes to uh, to your photo. We are likely bringing updates to Fox. Uh, just use some lessons we learned throughout Glade. We're probably gonna bring a big update to Fox in the near future. So yeah, so that has been uh, very exciting as well. Yeah, that's really cool. Um, it's interesting how all these things overlap and intersect. I know we're talking about artists, but AI is is definitely reaching out and touching all parts of our lives. And there's there's not going to be an industry that isn't hit um, and or impacted by by artificial intelligence. It's it's opening up right now, and uh, you know now's the time. Now's the time to to enhance your knowledge. I'm I'm sure as as you agree, Sean. Um, do you have any other like back, uh, you know, as someone who's behind the scenes, anything you'd like to share with our audience? Uh, yeah, I think, I think I do want to share is, you know, as, you know, as, as Marna says, totally true that AI will impact us, uh, you know, in the near future and some positive impacts and probably negative impacts. But I would say that, you know, is, I think not as bad as, what we imagine, right? I think to a lot of artists that we talk to, people think, okay, this is going to be end of my career, you know, next month. I'm not going to get job anymore next month. It is definitely has impacts, but I think just sheer amount of scare people have of artificial intelligence is, I think, a little bit more than what the harm it actually bring right now. I think it's good to be aware and try to prepare for it. But I think, but also at the same time, uh, be a little bit realistic in, in the space just to, you know, do for our own mental health and to think about AI in a more objective way rather than thinking this as, you know, a scary, super intelligence that's going to come after us, you know, within a year or something like that. So I think that has been, um, you know, a helpful way to, to think about this. I do see, you know, for people who have less technical backgrounds, you know, looking at how crazy some of the text, some of the, you know, question answering that AI can do, it does look very scary, but I think at the end of the day, you know, they are still evolving. They are, you know, still far from perfect. And many of the sectors are not, you know, directly impacted uh, by that uh, at this moment. So. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. I, I, <clears throat> I think the psychological impacts um, of the tools are, are causing a lot of people a lot of fear. And, you know, there was a question just submitted. Um, do you feel it's net good or net bad with AI? And I just want to put it out there, you know, as an organization, Artly World, and it sounds like um, Sean's kind of on the same page here, but our organization, we're not um, anti or pro. We want um, you to understand that these are tools that can be leveraged. There will be some, some uh, problems that arise in the meantime, like what we're facing right now with being able to properly attribute and properly credit um, people. And regulation is moving really slow to, to do anything about that. But in the meantime, you know, like there are some options, some protections you can take such as glaze, um, or just be a little more strategic about what you're posting online and, or also think about the overall, how much harm is it doing, you know, to you personally, um, or is it more a political stance, you know, for, for yourself? So, so some of these thoughts and just realize AI is going to be a tool. It can be leveraged and now's the time to just enhance knowledge and, and become familiar, um, and from our discussions here in Austin, most of the most of the artists are are starting to see like it's it's a tool, um, and it's going to affect the way we think 
and it's really causing us to question things like what what are we what do we value and it's and this is why it's revolutionary like what is it that we value in art what is it that we value in artists work um, what is it that makes it um, human and can AI help you know, can can it assist us a little bit and take away some of the monotonous tasks, maybe some of the repetitive tasks, um, and and make make it make it make it available for us to to make an impact on a larger scale um, as an artist, or is it going to cause us to lose you know touch with with human creativity? Um, th this is kind of the discussions that are coming out of our events here in Austin, and. We wanna welcome all of you. I know we're talking to artists across the nation now to be a part of this conversation and send us ideas. Let us know how you can be more part of this conversation. What 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 do you wanna see from us? Um, what resources, what um, events, um, how can we open this platform a bit more and get more voices talking about this and speaking back to these uh, tech companies? We definitely want your feedback and and want to hear from you um one of the ways we do gather feedback is when you leave <laughs> the webinar this evening a survey will pop up and it's anonymous and you can type your comments you can be as as uh positive or negative as you want no one knows who you are i would love to read your comments um we do have humans reading your comments not ai um, so that we know what you need and want as the artist community. So, so please um, submit your comments via that survey. And again, I do want to remind you that we have other webinars coming up. I posted the link to the copyright one next week if you're interested in copyright issues and where that's headed and how copyright is changing. Um, so I can post that link one more time. Again, it's via Zoom um, and the recording will be posted on that resource YouTube channel. So if you do miss the live event, you can always watch the recording on that resource YouTube channel. But if you're in person, you get to have the Q&A. And I think that's the most important part is you will get to ask questions with an expert as, as we did tonight. We have someone who knows the behind the scenes, what's going on, and you can ask those questions. Um, next week, it'll be an international lawyer specializing in, AI, specializing in AI and copyright. So you can ask uh, questions that you may have to an actual lawyer. And that's why we encourage you to attend these events live. But um, I don't see any other questions. I think we've addressed most most things. It was a very good talk. I saw a lot of thank yous. Thank you, Sean, for sharing um, this background knowledge, behind the scenes about your research. Um, it's really, really interesting. Love that you guys are, are trying to do stuff um, for the community. I know that in the academic world, um, there are a lot of people doing a lot of good things and providing it for free. But because it's not monetized, a lot of people don't find out about it. It's not, uh, you know, publicized or, mar or marketed enough. So we're happy to let people know about Glaze. And I love that you're also promoting other tools um, via your Twitter. Um, you mentioned MIST and a couple of others coming out of other universities as well. I love that there's this academic community that's trying to work together on a solution that seems to be moving faster than regulation. I, I think that's really interesting uh, development in this whole AI scheme. Um, but thank you so much for sharing and talking about Glaze. Do you have any final words of inspiration or encouragement before we uh, before we leave for the evening uh, no i think uh, yeah no i just want to really kind of appreciate everyone for coming to you know hear about uh, how this ai system works and hear about glaze and and really love any feedbacks uh, you guys may have about glaze any ideas or any you know comments about glaze so feel free to uh email me also feel free to email glaze and we'll you know have to answer all the questions that you may have in the future okay so thanks all again so just to clarify, if they want to reach out to you, it's that Google Groups email. That's the is that the email that they would? Yeah, so that's a Google Group email. So I will share the slides after this with you, and you can post. I will also include all the you know links like the Glaze Twitter, our website, Web Glaze, as well as my personal emails as well. There. Yeah, 
Yeah. So um, yes, we will be sharing the slides. Um, watch, keep an eye on your email to all attendees. We'll we'll share the slides with you, and there'll be contact info there and and plenty of links. But with that, thank you everybody for coming. Thank you so much again, Sean. Um, we look forward to hearing about the developments with Glaze and what and moving forward. So I'm very excited. And uh, thanks for uh, being our first webinar in this uh, new iteration of the ARP project. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Thanks, Al. All right. All right. Have a good evening, everybody. Bye.